Uh, according to the uh, uh, schedule, I'm going to talk about Bayesian topic molding, molding using Dirichlet process mixture model. I, uh, I kind of know about one of those words, what they mean, so uh, <laughs> better not. Um, no, instead I'm going to talk about, and you'll, you'll notice that the, uh, uh, the topic on the slides are different from the ones also in the schedule. I, I kind of deleted them and follow up a new title and delete that and follow up a new title and uh, I'm left with this one which is still not really what I'm going to talk about but it's the best thing that I managed um, and that's actually also the topic of my talk is um, the magic circle or how I learned to stop worrying and love the bugs um, and you'll notice that so it says uh, assistant professor in design um, so my talk is going to be a little bit more uh, about design about psych psychology than uh, the previous ones but like, I guess like, like you or most of you, uh, I actually have a background in computer science. So uh, I studied um, uh, for my bachelor's and master's computer science in Utrecht. Uh, and like undoubtedly most of you, this has damaged me a little bit. So um, I have a certain, you, you inherit a certain way of thinking about engineering, about uh, how to do science. And um, I guess this talk is about how that not, is not always maybe the best approach. Um, and like the previous two talkers of today, um, I will spend most of it, I guess, about uh, talking about my PhD research. Um, first off, because this is, of course, summer school for PhD students, so hopefully you can uh, learn from my mistakes or the things that I did well. Uh, also because, um, of course, as a professor, you don't have that much time for research, so cherish the, the still the four years that you have doing research. Um, but, but primarily, most of all, it's because um, even when you're done with your PhD after four years and you've written your dissertation, so your book, and you think, okay, I've written the most definitive work on the topic that I just, just studied, or maybe that's just me that was thinking that at the time that I wrote it. Um, even then, sorry my friends, science is never done. So years later, the research that you did and that you think that you closed your chapter of the book will come back to haunt you and torment you and all the things that you think, oh well, God, I did this wrong and that was wrong and that, that doesn't, doesn't make sense. Um, and, and that's really <laughs> what this is going to be about. So, um, but let's start all the way at the beginning, which is now, I guess, uh, seven, eight years ago. Um, I started my PhD and the idea was we want to improve game design, right? And that sounds like a very simple idea, but then you start breaking it down and it becomes a little bit more difficult because how do you improve a game, you know? Just, just as a question, um, are there people here who play video games? One, two, three, oh, four, five, okay, yeah, that's okay. Um, still, I mean, uh, um, even the ones that don't do it probably have an idea that, you know, you play a game for fun and um, well, you can't really put a metric on fun, I guess. Well, you can ask people how much do you like it, and, but, but there, are, there are many different kinds of games. You have puzzle games, you have um, action games, you have more adventure games, you have story-driven games or, or games that don't have a story at all. So, so how do you take all that and, and how do you improve it? So what metric do you use? Um, right? Uh, There are so many different games, but, but, but we do have this feeling that games become better over time. So if you were to play games nowadays, um, they're, they're quite big, they have good production values, but also during the gameplay, uh, there are lots of things that you can play around with, it feels right. Um, but if you go back to very old games, like 30 years ago, uh, it's a lot clunkier, it's not as much fun, you, you'll see that the systems don't have that much depth or, or they're not that interesting. Um, and so over the years, there, there does seem to be a progression of games getting better. So, so there should be some kind of metric, right? Something that should improve uh, the way that you develop games or, or experience them at least. And at some point we figured, okay, well maybe, um, maybe we should focus on serious games. And serious games are games that are used for learning something. Uh, and they're, they're becoming quite a bi big industry by now. Um, for instance, you can make a game uh, for firefighters to train what it is to train a fire and do it without putting them into actual harm uh, and, and 
you can have all these little permutations in the game. So it's actually a, a, a good way to, to learn something by playing a game. And the nice thing, of course, about serious games is that they have an ulterior goal, right? We play an entertainment game just to have fun, but at least a serious game has a goal, so you know what the game has to be designed for in order to, to reach. So you can measure them, right? So that's the main reason why we focused on serious games, uh, so that we have a, have a metric for when we approve something that we know does actually improve something. But actually, um, actually every game is about learning. Um, when you play a game in, in general, it's a, it's a certain, you, uh, you encounter a progression of challenges, of obstacles that you need to overcome. Um, things that you need to, enemies that you need to defeat or certain puzzles that you need to solve. Um, and generally these become more difficult over time. So, um, so any game has what they call a learning curve. Right? You've probably heard of it before, a learning curve. Um, or at least, a, at least a difficulty curve. So something, um, a difficulty that ramps up uh, as you get further along, as you get better at the game. So, um, and this is actually a backbone of a game. Most of the times, if a game is interesting, then it has a good learning curve. Then you learn a lot in a short period of time and have fun while doing it. That's actually what games are about. So, in this case, we had a, we had a feeling that we had something here. So if we focused on how to improve serious games, the learning in serious games, uh, then we also know a little bit some, some guidelines on how to improve game design itself. At least that was the idea. Right, so like I said, all games actually revolve around learning. And, and the interesting thing is that games are fun, right? You play games and you learn actually quite a lot. Most of it is not really useful, right? You know, orcs don't exist, so you don't really have to know how to defeat them. But anyway, um, uh, you did learn how to defeat orcs. So, so there's something there that you learned and you were fun, having fun doing so. Uh, and because they are motivating, generally we expend more cognitive effort while playing a game. So um, I'm having a talk right now and mo probably some of you are thinking, uh, <sighs> um, not so much if I would put all my uh, information into the game that you can play, then maybe you would have a lot more fun and pay closer attention and, and learn more. Uh, and so these are really the things where um, games can have an added benefit. So, um, so it's nice that you actually, people um, try to add more cognitive effort while learning something, while playing a game. Um, the nice thing about serious games is that you can play at your own pace, so um, people who, who, for whom a talk might go too fast can really play a game and, and do it at their own pace and really understand something before going on, so it's adaptive. Um, the hope is that it can engage poorer students, right? Uh, children at school who drop out um, because they, they're really not interested in um, sitting in the school bench and, and learning from books. Uh, hopefully, if you create more games and put it into the curriculum, then uh, these children are learning more. Um, you could maybe even take the game home and, and play outside of school. Um, and because you like learning in a game, um, the idea of the, of the serious games community is also that uh, it increases your attitude towards learning. So if children have a better... Um, yeah, better experience with learning because they learn from games, then maybe later on in life they will uh, like to continue on learning. So that's, that's really, um, well, that, that's what serious games or at least the promise is about. And in that setting we were trying to find um, game design guidelines. And in order to think, okay, how, how can we improve learning in such a setting? Um, there's a, there's a famous theory called cognitive load theory, and that says that um, whenever you want to learn something, um, you have to expend certain cognitive load. So uh, the, the learning material um, imposes a load on your brain uh, that you have to somehow manage uh, in order to learn something. And it says that there are basic three components of cognitive load. You have the um, intrinsic cognitive load, which is the difficulty of the learning task itself. So if you want to do uh, mathematics, then that's intrinsically difficult, at least uh, if you get a bit more advanced. Um, and that has a certain intrinsic difficulty, an intrinsic cognitive load. 
then you have the germane cognitive load. That is the um, cognitive capacity that you have to use in order to understand the intrinsic difficulty of the material. Right? It's devoted to processing information. Right? What does it mean, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, and then you have the extraneous cognitive load. And that's everything that, that, you, that is really actually not necessary, but is imposed by um, badly designed systems. And in general, you could say that this is always bad, right? So you want to have as much as possible of this and as little as possible of, of that. And that's the theory. So that's something um, that we thought, you know, this is something that you can work with. Uh, what are ways to decrease the extraneous cognitive load? Now, if some of you are very perceptive, you might say, well, this is um, actually a bit of a strange theory. Uh, Extraneous cognitive load is bad. Yeah, that's circular, right? It's, it's bad because it's extraneous and it's extraneous because it's bad. So this doesn't really mean anything. And can you really separate these two? No, you can't. So um, halfway into my uh, dissertation, luckily I had another theory that I can latch onto because this one is starting to um, become a little bit less used. But in any way, um, there are actually examples of games and it's a bit dark, so I'm, you can't really see it that well. Um, there are examples of, of entertainment games uh, that are sold where um, they use these principles of trying to decrease the extraneous cognitive load while you're playing the game, because actually games are pretty complex, especially the people who don't play games. Um, might be at the first time you pick up a controller with 20 buttons, you're like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you probably have the same impression as when I read about Bayesian molding. Um, it's a, it's a lot to, to take in and um, uh, to understand the first time. And, and if it's too difficult, then it's not a lot of fun. So, but people who are used to it, um, they can focus more on the game. But the game itself is also quite difficult because often you have the, like 3D worlds that you have to navigate with the controller. So there's a bit of uh, hand-eye coordination there um, with lots of difficult concepts within the game world that you have to somehow understand. Um, and so, for instance, and it's, like I said, it's not really that clear, but um, if you are fighting lots of enemies, then the one that you are actually targeting will sometimes have a halo around it, just to show you, okay, this is the person that you should be focusing on. Another thing, this is from the um, famous game Half-Life Half 2. Uh, it's a shooter game, and most people of you will recognize, I guess, um, so you have this reticule, you have a weapon, and you walk around in 3D space. Um, and often you have at the bottom of the screen s stuff like a health bar and am ammunition. So how many bullets do you have left? Uh, but they found out that it's actually quite difficult to read the status indicators at the bottom of the screen. Uh, why? Because you're focused on the center of the screen. So all this going from the center to the edge and back, this is what we call a visual search. This is all actu actually extraneous. So this, this leads to, to more cognitive processing that you really don't need because you're already focused on the game itself. So what they did is, is they moved the health indicator next to the reticule. So there's a little bar here, uh, which is how much health you have left. And so this is really a way in which current games uh, try to optimize, um, yeah, try to optimize your cognitive load so that you can really put all your effort and, and attention to the game itself and not to the interface, which might be uh, um, causing extra distress or problems. All right, so this is, this is already something that is happening in games. And so we figured, okay, can we find things like this for serious games and how to improve them? And so what I did in my PhD is I, I made a computer game. Um, it's a game for triage training. And um, triage is basically a procedure for medical first responders if there's some kind of catastrophe. So it could be that um, um, a bomb went off or, or a, a train derailed or something, and there are lots of people who have an injury. The first medical first responder who, who, who arrives at the scene has to classify the victims according to how badly injured they are. Um, and so that's when the rest of the ambulance personnel arrives, they can immediately go to the heavily injured people and, and leave the minor injured people for a later time. So this is a quick classification scheme of um, injuries, basically. And so what I did is I, I created this, this game. It's, um, 
it's based in a subway, so there was a, a terrorist strike on the subway and lots of people were injured. Um, and you play the medical first responder who arrives at the scene and has to start classifying people. And actually you don't really know what the procedure is and the goal of the game is to try to find out uh, as you go from one victim to the next and you get certain feedback for your actions, try to figure out uh, how to do this classification. So that was the, the main game that I made at the beginning of my PhD and then we figured, okay, uh, can we use this for experiments, try to find out different design guidelines. And just so you get a, I won't go into too much detail, but just so that you get a bit of an understanding of, okay, wh what, what is a triage procedure? It's basically just a few steps um, where first you check whether if somebody can still walk, right? Might be that the person is missing both of his arms, but if you can still walk, then he's likely injured. That's the kind of a quick uh, categorization that they do. So is the victim mobile? Yes, then uh, likely injured. Then you have to check the airway. So is the airway obstructed or free? Um, how quickly do they, do the, does the uh, victim breathe? And um, how is the blood circulation? So according to these four steps, you can immediately classify somebody as slightly injured or moderately or heavily injured or dead. So the game was, was made for learning something, learning a, a simple, quite a simple procedure. Um, but apart from that, there was also, of course, a reason why we thought that this was a good opportunity to make a game. It's also because uh, often these first responders have to um, operate under, under a lot of stress. And the nice thing about a game is that you can create this virtual environment where stress might occur, uh, more so than when you try to read from a book. Uh, so what we did is, is um, or what I did, is create something of a, of a short, um, what they call environmental narrative. So you arrive in a train station and you see that there's lots of uh, signs of chaos. There's no people, they all left, but things are knocked over. And then as you find your way to the subway, which is kind of like a labyrinth, uh, a very spooky music starts playing and you see blood spatters everywhere. And it's really hopeful, hoping to get people to become um, kind of scared or, or emotionally vested in, into the game. Um, at least that was the idea. So, so you, um, you, get, you get a little bit scared, a little bit aroused, uh, and then you have to do the triage procedure on the victims. Okay, and I and, um, won't go to too much details, but this was the, uh, um, the model of learning that we used. It basically says, um, you have this sense data, this, this data that you see on the screen and that you hear from the game. Um, and the information that you get, you first have to select, then to organize, and then to integrate in your long-term memory. And then what we did is, is we did four experiments um, where we did randomized controlled trials on little design interventions to see if that led to better learning. So what we did was, for instance, um, something that you see often is, is we helped the player learning it by just having large green arrows pointing at the things that they had to check. Um, you have here the, uh, uh, the menu with which they can check for certain symptoms. Uh, and in one version of the game, um, they only got the, uh, uh, how do you say, it? The, the checks that they had to perform uh, were introduced um, one by one, basically. So they just learned the things that they had to do first before getting uh, new options to do. So it was more of a, um, this was more of a gradual increase of complexity and, and here they had got everything from the, from the beginning on and had to figure it out themselves. So these were two experiments and we do two experiments. This one doesn't show itself very well in a, uh, in a picture, sadly, but um, we made the game adapt to the performance of the player. So if somebody was doing very well uh, with some of the earlier victims, they would immediately go on to more difficult victims. And in the other version, um, there was no adaptation, so they just had to do everything. And finally, the last uh, experiment is I added the number of surprising events in the game. So they would walk around and suddenly kabam, and there was an explosion. Um, all the lights would go off and then go on, and then they had to continue on with the game. So just a few minor surprising events that didn't really impact the learning itself, but uh, we wanted to see whether that had an effect on learning. 
Okay. Um, so that was my PhD research. Uh, it actually led to some, some interesting results. So uh, in terms of learning, um, most of them actually didn't really matter. <laughs> so the, uh, the queuing, the one of the green arrows, uh, actually led to a little bit of worse warning, uh, learning. Um, and one thing that really did learn to learning efficacy was actually the uh, introduction of surprising events. So that, that really, uh, whenever you put some surprising events into your game, people start paying closer attention and start learning better. So that was something that we found. Um, and overall, it actually, that's, well, if you're interested, of course, you can, you can get the thesis. But um, it really did really lead to some interesting results in how learning occurs in a game and, and how you can influence it with different uh, interventions. Um, and actually, I, I got uh, um, a very positive remarks from some of the top researchers in the field saying, well, this was really, really helpful and, and good job. So that was, I was really happy with that. Um, however, uh, my interventions, at least the ones that were made to, to lead to uh, more engagement, didn't really have an effect, at least not on the engagement part. So we did learn a lot about learning, but engagement not so much. And that was kind of, that bugged me a little bit. You know, it was surprising, um, could happen. Uh, for instance, the adaptation, so the, the, the version where um, we adapted to the performance of the player, where good players would get more difficult cases and uh, bad players would get easier cases. Uh, that actually tied into a very prevalent theory of motivation in games, but also in sports or it's, uh, in everything basically, called flow theory. That people like to have a challenge that is just right for their skill level. Right? And if that happens, then they, they reach a flow state and they forget about everything and then they're completely engaged with the thing that they're working with, for instance, a game. Um, but we didn't see any effect of that. So there was no difference in engagement. The version with surprising events had much more things happening, was much more exciting, at least when I designed it, just what I thought, uh, than the version without any, anything happening, basically. Um, but we also saw no difference in engagement. So that, that, that we didn't, yeah, more learning, but not more engagement. So that was also something that, that was surprising. Um, And I mean, there could be a number of reasons for this. Um, everybody here familiar with Likert skills? It's basically if you have some kind of questionnaire, you ask, uh, are people, do they agree with it or not? Uh, and with that, you try to get a sort of subjective experience of people who are using your artifact. Um, I used one that had a five point Likert skill. So you have strongly disagree, disagree, undecided agree, and strongly agree. Um, if I could give a tip to you guys, if you do research, Never do a five point, always use a seven point or nine point. Uh, I think five point skills were developed in the USA and Americans are very good at saying, yes, I strongly agree. Yes, I strongly disagree. Um, in my experience, at least in the Netherlands, um, people are always kind of here and, and then you don't have any, any uh, effect measurement. So that could, be, that could be really something that played a part here. However, what, what really grinded my gears was that we um, also did a test where we had my game, so, so one group played my game and the other group uh, just read a PowerPoint version of the game, just saw some images of the triage procedure and learned the basic facts of that. And we also saw no difference in engagement. So, so the people who just saw a static PowerPoint were just as uh, motivated by the things that they were learning as the people who played the video game with all the nice explosions and all the thing, other things that I included. So that was um, painful. Um, now for me, that wasn't that big a problem um, because it was mostly about learning. Um, but we did a, a meta-analysis later and if you have anything to do with games, and I think it's only Myra, but in that case you might have heard of it because it's now it's getting cited like crazy. Um, but we looked at all the different research that is done on, on serious games and we tried to determine, so does it lead to more learning. Are serious games actually good at what they do? And we found out that actually somewhat surprisingly, yes, they are, uh, they are very good at teaching people and they are actually serious games perform better than traditional instruction. So that's something that's very hopeful. Um, however, there was no evidence for motivating qualities. So we didn't really see that games were more motivating than traditional instruction. And that's something um, that could be a problem. Um, and in fact, 
there were there were four people here who play games or five people. Does, does anybody of you play serious games? Um, and I mean at home, like when you uh, when you're not at work. Uh, Myra, maybe, maybe, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that, okay. That, that, I mean, that's that's uh, understandable. However, I asked the same question to a conference full of serious games developers and uh, researchers. Uh, so, who here plays serious games at home for fun? Um, and yeah, absolutely nobody raised their hand. And um, and this is kind of awkward in the sense that these are people like me who think serious games are so important that they devote their life to it, um, who always say that they're so motivating and it's great and you have to do it and, and buy them and it's awesome. Um, and nobody of us really plays it at home. And, um, and yeah, this might be a problem, <laughs> right? So, so, so what is it? What, what, what is the problem? Um, and like I said, I studied computer science, so I have this engineering mind. And I think, okay, maybe we just need to improve fun. Um, so what could it be? Um, maybe it's just a case of, of usability, right? Um, maybe um, the, the, we, we need to improve the controls or the gameplay or some way. Um, and, and really there's, there's a point to be made for that. Um, when you develop a serious game, oftentimes you start with the end goal, which is the, for instance, the learning or some kind of persuasion or something, other kind of goal that you might have with your game. Uh, and then you develop the game towards this end goal. When you look at the development of games, it's often the other way around. There's a famous example. Um, does everybody know Mario? I guess, yeah, that, I guess that transcends even if you play games or not. But um, Mario 64, um, when they developed the game for the first year, everything they had was little Mario in a small virtual garden. And that was the only thing that was there for a year long. And what did they do th during this year? They really focused on and iterated and kept improving uh, the feel of the game. So is it nice to do a backflip? Is it nice to jump? Is it nice to slide ac across the garden? Is it nice to climb in trees? Uh, and they really, they really want to get this, this correct, right? So, so a year long was just basically trying to try to make it awesome to climb a tree. And only when that worked, when they were very, really confident, like, okay, it's very fun to control this game, then they started expanding the game with all these different obstacles and different levels and other things. Uh, and so you see it's actually the other way around, right? Uh, when you make an entertainment game, you start with, you start small, and you start with something that is fun, uh, and you iterate and, and until you have a nice prototype and then you expand. Uh, serious games are more um, traditional waterfall development, so you have requirements, you make them, you uh, it leads somewhere, and in the end, you have a game that is not fun, right? So, um, so that could that could okay. I mean, this could be a, um, a solution to the problem. Maybe we just start developing series games such a way that you start with a prototype and then you iterate. But then this happened. Who here is familiar with the game Quop? One of you. Okay. Um, I'll see if it works. I'll, I'll try to play it. Yeah, okay. Um, so this is the game Quop. And what it is, you're this runner on a track and field course, so you have to basically run towards the end of the game. Now, the interesting thing is that um, it's just outside the screen, but um, you have to play it with the Q, W, O, and P buttons. Uh, and basically what it does is you control the upper legs and the lower legs of the character, and that's everything. Is there anybody who wants to play? Okay, I'll, I'll do it myself then. Um, this, is, this is how difficult it is. <laughs> oh, crap. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> One last time. I've, I've got it, I've got, no, no. Oh. Oh. Um, so it's, it's this game where you struggle with the controls and, and you try and you fail and you try again and you fail and after lots of failing you end up worse than where you started. So it's actually a pretty good analogy of doing a PhD. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, this is this is a game that when you think back about the extraneous part and the intrinsic part and the domain part of cognitive load, this is a game that, that just capitalizes on extraneous. It's so the controls are so part of my friend's merde uh, that that is actually what the game is fun about. You know, this is why we like it. It's so crappy that everybody is having a good time playing it. And 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 how do you, um, as a scientist, what do you have to do with this? You know, it's it's all this time you're working to make things better, and actually the worst thing is what everybody flocks around and they have YouTube channels and everybody is having a good time around. So, um, so how do you quantify this? And and let's see if I can get the presentation back. Um, let's close down, I think. Okay, now I have the stupid bar here, sorry. Um, anyway. Um, and, and really what this shows, I think this game, this, this um, strange activity is, is um, well, I'll get to it later. First, let me explain what is the importance of play. Um, we already saw that um, games add motivation, right? Uh, add engagement. Uh, at something that you want to do for long periods of time. Um, so, so yeah, play and games, they, they uh, afford persistent effort. But also, um, beyond mere engagement, what we do when we play is basically we're simulating, simulating alternative worlds. Um, we're imaginating, uh, imagining them, right? So imagining some kind of fantasy where uh, we're not in battle, but we're really a pirate. Um, you do a certain negotiation, especially if you um, work together with another kid, for instance, uh, you say, bang, you're dead, and the other says, no, I'm not dead, I'm actually a, a robot. Oh, right, you're a robot, now I know. So this is kind of like this negotiation thing, stage that you're going in while you're playing, right? Um, there's also a certain restructuring, so you have these rules of society, but you're kind of molding them in your own way. It's like, no, I didn't really die, I became a robot, okay. Um, there's a certain frame of mind that you enter when you start playing, and it's actually good to have this kind of um, different paradigms on the world that you, uh, yeah, th that you switch between. There's also certain appropriation. So when you play games at some point, um, you start identifying with, for instance, being a robot, but also um, the thing that you're playing with, it, it sort of becomes your own as you play with it. Um, could be a persuasion uh, elements within play um, and also self-efficacy. So, you become good at a certain game, you become good at co-op after lots of trying and failing, um, and, and you feel good about yourself when you do it. So, um, outside of engagement, there are many more things why play are actually, is actually important. It's a thing that you want. Uh, and so we can't leave it at, I don't know the answer to co-op. Uh, we have to really understand it, because this is important. Um, and there's a famous example here. It's, uh, maybe you've seen it before. Uh, these are a number of pictures of um, a polar bear walking up to a husky. And uh, so, so some photographer got this on camera. Um, normally speaking, if a polar bear walks up to a husky, it's goodbye husky. You know, it's, there's, no, there's no way that uh, the, the dog is ever going to survive. But you see that the dog at some point started to becoming barking and becoming excited and jumping around. And the polar bear walked up to the dog and noticed that the dog was in a playful mood. And the polar bear said, oh, you know what? I'm going to roll up over my back and let's, let's play together. And, and so this is something, um, this playful mind is something that, that we share with animals, uh, but, but actually humans are very good at it. Um, and it's, it's important uh, in a way to create a safe environment where you can explore things and, and um, have a fun time together. And that's actually one of the reasons, so you might have heard about this, is that um, education is, is undergoing reforms because our educational model was, was focused on the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, so uh, how do you learn how to go to a factory and uh, learn all the skills that are needed there? Um, 
the new information age, we need different skills. Uh, and so they're, they're really looking at, at what do students, what do children of today have to learn. Uh, and there are a number of different things that they have to learn. And actually, um, play is one of the things that uh, are get, is getting more and more important. This is something that children have to become good at <laughs> in order to later on uh, pass school. And that, of course, has to do with experiential learning. So learning by doing, trying to figure out while you're experimenting with things, how they work. Uh, and the systems thinking, so trying to understand how complex systems work. And, and actually, um, this was a Dutch guy from the 1930s, I think, um, already said that um, what we call homo sapiens should actually be called homo ludens. So we are a play playful um, being, a playful animal, and most of our culture is actually a result of play. And of course, then you have to take play as a very broad definition, but having this frivolous, this, this non-functional, this, this fantasy interaction with each other, that's something that leads to culture. And that's actually um, something they call the magic circle. And the magic circle is not a very good scientific term. There's much of, lots of things that are wrong with it if you try to go into the strict definition. Um, but it's actually useful, I think, if you think about it, is, um, is this frame of mind that you enter when you get into the play state, into a playful mind. So basically what they say is um, you create this magical bubble around you where the rules of the world have changed a little bit. Right? So um, walking is faster than skipping, but uh, in my own playful mind, skipping might be the best thing there is, so I start skipping. So this is a kind of uh, what we call a magic circle. This is this playful mind that we enter. And it's a frame of mind that we enter volitionally and to experiment frivolously. And when you think about that, um, you know, maybe serious games are too serious. Um, this is a picture that I got from the internet, just typed in serious games. So if anybody of you made this, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but this is kind of what serious games look like, right? You have a, a doctor and a patient, and you have to find out the cure uh, or the, the symptoms. Same as my triage game. Um, and it's often played by uh, students of, of uh, health or medicine. So. It's their job, and they're learning on their job. So it's, there's, there's really no fantasy element here. There's really nothing um, that creates a playful mood. It's really serious. So then we figured, you know, no, maybe, maybe serious games are too serious. So, so we did an experiment to see if maybe um, we could improve this playfulness or this, this gaminess of a game. Um, by making it a bit more fantastical. So this was a game made by a Dutch game developer, uh, and it's about um, learning to make decisions if you're in such a um, position of power. For instance, this was made for mayors um, or, or heads of police. Uh, they have to learn how to negotiate and how to extract relevant information from people saying opposite things and how to make decisions from that. And as you can see, I mean, they are cartoon characters, um, but they are humans, and they have uh, um, actual job names, such as operational consultant, and uh, physicist, and simulation specialist, system engineer. And um, yeah, so this, is, this was more the serious angle. And what we did is, you know what, let's make it fantasy. So here you have um, a number of aliens that are completely unrecognizable from humans, and they have uh, weird names such as, um, um, no, I can't really read it, but <laughs> anyway. Um, so now actually their, their jobs are similar, but, but the names are different. And what we did was we created a serious story where um, you had to have some kind of social media tracking system and a more fantastical story about a, a mental computing system. Same story, same learning goals, uh, same uh, way to use it, but one was very fantasy and the other was, was more grounded. And so th then we did an experiment and we found out that the more serious version led to better learning. So there was a, a significant difference there is that uh, people who saw the serious story afterwards, they had better mental models. We, we 
checked how, the, how they stored the information inside their head, and that was better. Um, but at the same time, the, fan the fantasy version felt more like a game. So it had a stronger, and this was quite a big um, effect size, uh, a stronger feel of a game. Right, so, so there's something there, but we're not quite there yet because the problem is the main goal for serious games is to, be, is to learn something, right? So you don't want to um, somehow lose the learning goals in order to make it more like a game. Fun is less important, right? If it's, as long as you learn something, then it doesn't really matter if it's fun or not. On the other hand, I mean, um, play and engagement, these were the main benefits of serious games. This was the reason why uh, everybody touted them. And if you think about the price of a serious game, if you want to develop a simple serious game, uh, base price is somewhere around 200,000 euro. We have an industry of about 8 billion dollar euros, uh, dollars, sorry, um, and, and gamification, which is sort of related, is also an industry of 3 billion dollar. Um, and almost you can say that right now this industry is operating on a lie. Uh, because there's not that much evidence that the games and the gamification is really that much more fun than traditional instruction. Okay, let's go back to my PhD research because I haven't been completely honest or, or um, disclosed everything to you. So we had this experiment where in one version of the game, um, the, the, the people who played it, the group who played it, started off with only two buttons. Uh, and as they proceeded on to more difficult cases, they would get more buttons, uh, more options. Um, in instructional design, this is called just-in-time information. And actually, when you want to give uh, an education, this is a good design decision, right? Because, uh, as we said, extraneous cognitive load, germane cognitive load. If you just give the things that are important at that time, um, people are better to integrate, uh, better at integrating it than that into their knowledge base. But what we didn't find was any difference in learning. So after about 19 different victims that they, they had to triage, uh, there was actually not that much difference in, in how much they learned from the game. What we did find was a very significant effect on engagement. And, and this version was liked much more than that version. Even though this one was perhaps closer aligned to their skill level, etc., a better challenge for the skill level, that one was more difficult, but people liked it more. And there's, um, there's a theory from psychology that fits in with this a little bit. It's the idea that um, people are motivated from a moment-to-moment -moment basis um, because they need to satisfy three bi basic psychological needs. Uh, a need for competency, a need for autonomy, and a need for relatedness. Everything we do, if we are intrinsically motivated, is born out of our need to have these feelings satisfied. Uh, for intrinsic motivation, right? So there are also extrinsic motivations. You can get money for standing somewhere and talking. That, that, that's, um, I'm not getting money, by the way, but uh, uh, th that could also be an extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation, these things we need, and these things games are good at. Um, and in this case, you could say, well, okay, maybe if you have more options, then you get more autonomy, right? Uh, and so this could fall in line with this theory. That could be an explanation why that game was more fun. Strangely enough, um, people actually scored worse in the version uh, with more buttons because they could make more mistakes. So you would say their feeling of competence would go down because they didn't get this positive, they didn't get the high scores, not, no positive reinforcement. Uh, and still they liked it more. Now when you contrast this, what we know from other serious game studies is something else that is actually quite interesting. Um, so far, at least as far as I'm aware, uh, every serious game study finds that uh, when they look at different difficulty levels that players always like the easiest setting. So there's this idea that we like to play games because they're difficult, but at least from the research we always see people like easiest. However, in my version of the, of the experiment, here they liked making mistakes. Right? So they liked the version where they made more mistakes, was more difficult, um, but they got more engagement from it. And, and so here's where I'm, I'm starting to um, hypothesize a little bit, so you don't have to agree with me. Of course, you don't have to agree with my previous either, but uh, there I at least had statistics. Um, it seems like when you think about games, 
um, people seem to want a certain negotiation space. Um, and that's actually quite logical. If you have a learning tool, such as a series games, people might approach it as a tool, something they do in order to get better at something or something that has a certain goal. If you have a wrench, um, then um, you might appreciate the wrench for unscrewing the screw or, or whatever. <laughs> um, but you don't really love the wrench, right? It's, you don't have, an, you don't have a, a, a affective um, bonding with it. Even though it has all these options, right? You can, you can um, resize it, you can use it for diff very different uh, bolts and screws. Um, so it has options, it gives you competence, but we don't have a, we don't have a connection with that. Um, you don't bring it around saying, this is my wrench. Look at my wrench. Um, however, with games, we do say, uh, come over, look at how I'm playing Quop and see if you can do better. And um, so it kind of feels like people like to have options, like to have a certain negotiation space, um, but only if it's not strictly functional. Here it's just options in order to improve the efficiency of the tool. Here it's options um, which kind of improves the inefficiency, right? But it's it's fun, so that's why we like it. And it's somewhat similar, I think, to, um, for instance, jeans. You know, jeans with holes in them um, cost a lot more than jeans without holes in them. <laughs> and why is that? Uh, and it's kind of um, because it has certain customization, right? Nobody has these holes, you have other holes, so it's, you stand out a bit more. But also because um, they, they, they are non-functional, right? It's, it's kind of strange. And, and, and this strangeness, this um, what does it mean, uh, that also elicits a certain effective response. And it's even more similar, I guess, to cars. Um, some of you might have bought an old car. Um, I didn't. I waited until I have enough money to buy a good one. But um, most people buy into an old car. And, and they find out that um, after many years, this was actually the car they liked the most. Um, it's a car, for instance, where you have to uh, bang the hood three times and then um, put it into neutral and then back into one and back into neutral before it started working, for instance. And at some point, you are the only person who understands this car and, and uh, other people don't understand it. And, and that's why you love it, because that's the, that's the thing that makes it give character, that has a certain um, personality that you have to learn how to negotiate with. And, and after this negotiation space, then you have a certain effective response, a certain um, love for this car. And so new cars are tools, old cars have character. And that's something that, um, that we try to um, have students work out with a little bit when they, when they start designing. So these are bachelor students, they're not very good um, um, prototypes, but just to give an uh, impression of, of what we want them to, to play around with, to see if they can instill this personality to have the sort of um, non-functional negotiation space within an object. So this is a, a lamp um, that sometimes starts sneezing. So. <laughs> See if it happens. <laughs> so, so every now and then it starts sneezing and, and you have to stroke it a number of times to so say there, there, that's good, and then, then it starts working again. Um, so ag again, it's this idea of, of lamps are in interactive, you know, you can turn them on, turn them off, but the moment that you start giving them certain um, weird, non-functional, frivolous uh, um, characterizations, uh, then suddenly it's no longer an idea of interactive, it's so more an idea of intelligence, I guess, not really intelligent, intelligent, but um, um, suddenly there's, there's a certain being there that you have to negotiate with somehow. Um, another example.
right? So, so we're creating this annoyance in, in products because that makes them endearing, right? That's, that's something that you have to work with. And, um, no science, we haven't scientifically tested it. It's more like an exploration, but uh, yeah. Things that make it playful, I guess, uh, without even play being there. Okay, um, so what are you trying to do? This is not my research, this is a, a PhD in, in um, our department. Um, what we did, for instance, uh, we, they, okay, um, let's create goals, we call them smart goals, uh, which are now used by PSV Eindhoven, which is our football club, um, for training. So there's like a, an intelligent distributed system, so all these goals are wirelessly in connection to each other. And some of them go on, and when you kick the ball through them, uh, they go out and other lights go on on another goal. Um, and with this system, um, you can, of course, use it for training, um, but you can also think about different ways in, in which the game is set up, in which the rules um, are set up, and, and so what kind of different play solutions arrive from here. Um, this is a simple system, but also in connection to each other. If you step on it, they change color. But then, then you can think about, OK, and, and um, do you want to have the color stay, stick for every uh, thing that you step on, or do the colors change, or do you have to sort of try to get the yellow color and not the red color? So with a simple system, you can kind of, kind of sort of design all different play solutions. Um, and we're now going to use it in, in trying to understand better is how do you create this frivolous negotiation space uh, in a system. So how, how do you change the system into something playful? What are the boundaries of the magic circle? Right, and some things that we're thinking about now um, is, is systems of, or patterns that you see in nature that are somehow interesting to us. Right, and you see it in flocking of bir birds, for instance. Um, one point is all random, and then suddenly it starts swarming into a, a recognizable pattern. It seems to have a mind of its own, and then it becomes random again. So these are things that, uh, that interested us, that, that could make a system engaging um, purely from a certain experiential perspective. Um, previous talk, we heard also about the pheromone trail. So um, ants leave a certain trail, and other ants start following it. So maybe you can try to enter this thing into, uh, into such a playful system. So um, leave marks while you're interacting with the system for other people to follow and, and also act upon. Um, dynamic systems sometimes have tipping points. So one point if you're playing a game, you might be losing. And at some point, there's a tipping point, And suddenly, the game goes into your direction, and you start winning. Uh, these are also things that people find cognitively interesting. Um, could be something that makes, makes um, systems more exciting. And if this sounds all a little abstract and vague, then that's because for us, too, it's still a little bit abstract and vague. So these are things that we're trying to put into our uh, play, um, how do you say it, um, um, yeah, play solutions to see if this helps in, in creating something a bit more playful. Because really, what we're looking for is, um, you must have heard something about gamification. Gamification is the idea of uh, we have a certain activity, for instance, working, um, and we're going to make it fun. So every time you deliver a paper, you get a badge, and we say yes. Um, and this is the idea of what they call chocolate-covered broccoli. So we have this um, experience that's not that much fun, but we add game elements, and now it's awesome. Uh, it doesn't really work, because once you crunch through the, broccoli, you, uh, through the chocolate, you eat broccoli. Um, so that, that, that doesn't really help in making it much more motivating. So what we're looking for is how do you make the experience itself more motivating? How can you add, if you're running a playful moment, like I said, a certain maybe compartment of negotiation space, something that you can put in your own will and, and move with the rules and then go back into the actual running. So how do you make the um, activity itself fun from a playful experience? Uh, perception. And um, in order to do that, we're just starting a new student project, so I don't have any results yet. Hopefully, next time I'm presenting here. Um, we're working together with elementary schools and with the big manufacturer of gym equipment 
to see if we can make, um, if we can introduce playful elements through intelligence um, products and systems into the uh, elementary school gym class. Because the idea is that already in this early age, of course, um, some kids might be very good at sports. And these kids will generally get very positive reinforcements from sports, right? So, so they're always top of the class. They're, they, they want to uh, throw a javelin. They throw it exactly into the, uh, um, into the bullseye, you know? And, and um, so these kids, whatever they do, they get positive reinforcement from sports. All the other kids, not so much, right? They see that they're always worse than this good kid. And, and, and we think that at that point, they start internalizing that sports or healthy activity is not really for me. Um, and so we're going to figure out if it's possible to add the playful elements for those children so that it becomes more a safe spot, more within the magic circle, and they can um, have a playful time with their uh, activity. So that's something that we're starting right now, actually, um, and I'm hopeful that afterwards we have better uh, understanding of what it means to play inside an activity. So um, that leads to the end, the moral of the story. Um, Maybe some of you already have a significant other, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, husband, or wife, and you really love this person. And probably that's not because the other person is perfect, although it's, of course, close to perfect as possible, but you love the person for all the weird things about them or the things that are not that, that nice or, or the, the slightly big nose that they might have. Um, and so people don't really like perfect. Perfect is boring. You know, perfect is a tool, something that, that you don't have any connection with. But if there's little defects, little idiosyncrasies, uh, then we start liking or, or loving them. And this could be a very important thing if you want people to actually use your system. So you could make the most perfect uh, sensing equipment there is. Um, but of course, if nobody uses it, then tough luck. Um, and you probably know the, the saying, it's not a bug, it's a feature. Uh, I think it can do much better. It's not a bug, it's play. It's something that is actually very good. So. Um, well, that was my story, and, and hopefully um, you can stop worrying and love your bugs as well in your project. Thank you. <laughs>